A new study has found the world's oceans were warmer in 2019 than at any other point in recorded human history. The research carried out by climate and ocean scientists from around the world suggests the rise in temperature is irrefutable and yet further proof of global warming. Last year's oceans were just one thirteenth of a degree Celsius warmer than the average. That was for 1981 to 2010. It sounds tiny, but the consequences could be catastrophic. Calm waters for now, but bubbling beneath the surface of our oceans, it's a very different picture. Scientists have been measuring how hot our oceans are and the results are compelling. 2019 was the warmest our oceans have ever been. In fact, the warmest 10 years on record have all been recorded in the past decade. And a leading scientist says the amount of heat we've put in our oceans in the past 25 years is the equivalent of 3.6 billion Hiroshima atom bomb explosions. The result, according to scientists, extreme weather events like the recent bushfires in Australia. More than 2,000 homes have been destroyed and at least 28 people have been killed. Now NASA says smoke from these bushfires will travel around the world. Record floods have also been seen in places like Venice. In November, 80% of the city was underwater when the tides were at their highest. The mayor there blames the disaster on climate change. Apocalyptic scenes were seen in the Bahamas in September when Hurricane Dorian brought heavy rain and high winds, claiming at least 50 lives. Closer to home, parts of the UK were also brought to a standstill by heavy downpours in November. Fish Lake in South Yorkshire was one of the worst affected places after the River Don burst its banks. Many people are now questioning how many more of these extreme weather events we might see. So what is going on? Why are our oceans getting warmer? Joining me now is Chris Thorne, an oceans campaigner at Greenpeace UK. And also with me is Dr. Michal Nekmani, a climate policy fellow from the Grantham Research Institute at the London School of Economics. Good evening to you both. Um, Chris, let's start with those temperatures. They sound pretty small. Why, why is it so significant? Well, it's absolutely shocking. Last year was the warmest ocean temperatures ever recorded on record. And that kind of follows a decade of the highest ever ocean temperatures too. And that is just really bad, bad news for the ocean. And humans are driving this. So when we burn fossil fuels, that's releasing greenhouse gases. And that greenhouse gas is trapping excess heat within the atmosphere. And the ocean is absorbing 90% of that excess heat. So it's no wonder that ocean temperatures are increasing. Why is it so bad? Why is it bad news for the environment? When we think about the rising temperatures and the rising temperatures of the ocean, we're talking about the future that is uh, awaiting for us and the disastrous uh, events that we see around the globe, as you've just as you've just all seen, are only a preview to what we're uh, going to be locked into if we do not change our behavior quite uh, quite immediately. The commitments that the uh, national governments have made around the world currently lock us to a warming trajectory of about three degrees Celsius on average. What that means is that we're going to be see, seeing more fires, we're going to be seeing more floods, we're going to see water shortages, we're going to see people fleeing from their homes because there are no uh, resources, there is no food. If we see insects dying because the temperatures are too hot for them, then we have no food. All of these impact us dramatically. And if we think locally, only in uh, recent heat waves in the UK, the Met Office just said, sorry, Public Health England um, um, recently said 900 excess deaths only from the UK heat wave recently. This is all very, very imminent, close to home and very grave. Mm, this is the impact on human life. Um, Chris, mm. what about then wildlife, marine life? So it can have devastating impacts on marine life too. So as, as the ocean warms, <clears throat> then that can, so for example, coral reefs, as the ocean warms, that bleaches coral reefs and they can die. And then that can have a knock-on effect on all of the sea creatures that live within that habitat, within that ecosystem. So a sea creature living in a coral reef, if it starts to die, it might have to travel further to feed. It might have to travel to a different place to breed or for shelter. And then that will have knock-on effects on other parts of the ocean because it's all one big interconnected system. And not only will it have a very severe impacts on marine life, it could also impa impact upon the biological processes that take place 
within the ocean too. So for example, marine creatures play a crucial role in the carbon cycle, capturing carbon, and they may longer be able to do that. And that's kind of a crucial feature of the ocean that can keep our planet cool. And we're risking, we risk losing that. Mm. I mean, Michal, you said governments aren't doing enough. W what do you want? What do you want leaders to do? What, what, what should nations be doing to tackle this? In November, uh, governments around the world are going to be um, uh, meeting in Glasgow for the 26th Conference of the Parties. And that is five years after the Paris Agreement, where they promised that they will ratchet up their ambitions. Everyone has to do better than they did five years ago. Now, what we said five years ago, collectively, takes us on a very dangerous path. So what we need to be seeing from now on, we, we, we needed to see it earlier, but of course we need to see this right now, is um, a commitment, not only to words, but also to action. We need to hold our politicians very, very closely to account over the promises that they deliver. It's very easy to declare a climate emergency. It's much more difficult to carry out the systemic changes in energy and transportation systems that you need in order to see those emissions cut um, effectively to zero. If you think about and you, you're going to be speaking about this later in the show, if you're thinking about um, cutting air passenger duty, for example, which has been um, mentioned today in the Indeed, UK, say flying what you're effectively yeah. signaling to people is, it's actually okay to fly more. Please, the price is actually going down. Why don't you fly a little more? That is actually really inconsistent with um, getting to net zero, which the UK is committed to. Out of interest, what, what, are your, what is your attitude then towards the airline industry as a whole, do you think people should, should not fly at all? This looks like such a big issue and how we tackle climate change, how we tackle um, dealing with the issues of the environment, it, it does seem like we, we are going to have to make big changes or does it necessarily, can it be small changes? We have to do a, a combination of two things. We have to create systemic changes and alternatives. So we have to have trains and they have to be affordable and they have to not leave any region behind in their accessibility. So we have to create those alternatives to the high emission um, options. But we also need to signal in pricing that um, air travel is expensive and if you travel a lot, you need to pay for it. It doesn't mean that we have to stop doing business, international travel, mm. visiting our parents uh, in other countries and so on. So I'm not suggesting to stop it at all, but we need to think about how reforming air travel. Okay, and Michal McNanny and um, Chris Thorne, really good talking to you both. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.